Thank you for joining us today. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we all mate on. Here in Canberra, I'm on Nanawal and Nambar people's land. And um, before um, I hand over to Carla, CEO of Migration Council Australia, who is going to chair today's session, I will just introduce the topic a little bit. So this today's webinar is a part of Harmony Alliance's leadership and professional development web webinar series. We have talked about um, identity, belonging, um, entrepreneurship, innovation, and those sort of um, things before. And this webinar, we decided to um, highlight migrant and refugee women in health responses and taking the leadership roles and taking initiatives and um, responding to COVID-19 pandemic in Australia. Um, so it is a very timely and very critical topic as well. And it is really important to highlight these women because um, all we see is most of the times white men in suit in health leadership. And uh, that's really the stereotype that we're trying to break here at Harmony Line. So showing, showcasing some fabulous women today. Um, I'll hand over to Carla, who will introduce today's panel and uh, start the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure and, and honour uh, to be with uh, the panellists today who have to be three of the most um, eminent women that I'm deeply humble, humbled to be on a panel with. Um, I'm actually going to ask the panellists to introduce themselves a little bit, uh, but I'll just do a couple of brief sentences first. Uh, so first of all, we have, um, and if you just wave perhaps so that we can um, identify, but could uh, say can Utu, uh, who is an infectious diseases physician and deputy chief uh, medical information officer based at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, she has over 15 years of clinical experience, uh, a deep commitment to health equity, uh, which has motivated her to take all sorts of leadership positions within health. Uh, she's on the National Migrant and Refugee Women's Health Initiative uh, and a, um, has a STEM ambassadorship uh, through Science and Technology Australia. Uh, so uh, absolutely um, stunning and stellar career. Uh, can I ask Kudzai, do you wanna uh, say just a couple more things about yourself and introduce yourself? Um, hi, yeah, I'm also a part-time homeschool teacher and part-time hairdresser uh, <laughs> and personal fitness coach, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> Next up, we have Nadia Chaves, uh, who is a general uh, and infectious diseases specialist. Uh, she's passionate about treating people as people uh, and is a Victorian Refugee Health Fellow. Uh, she is at CoHealth and Alfred uh, and has done a range of activities in the COVID space, including uh, implementation of uh, guidelines, healthcare worker wellbeing has been an area of focus, um, and is also a mother with two children e learning at home. Nadia? Hi, thank you for having me. And I actually wanted to, I'm, I'm not, a, I did a Victorian Refugee Health Fellowship a few years ago, um, but I wanted to actually start by thanking. Um, the Indigenous women who are leaders in our country and, and saying that in the COVID space, there's been some amazing work done in that space and it's really worth acknowledging what, what they've been doing in that space. And also there's so many migrant and refugee background women who have been working in this space. I feel quite um, honoured to be here, but feel like, you know, that there are so many people working and, and not, their work isn't being recognised, but thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, we have Aranaz Kumar, is a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist and educator in Melbourne, Australia. She's been leading work and engaging with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Uh, she has a PhD in interprofessional education, uh, migrated from India, uh, speaks many languages, uh, and is uh, deeply passionate about the care of migrant and refugee women during pregnancy. Aranaz. Thanks, Carla, for that kind introduction. Um, I love teaching, which is really core to what I do, and that includes engaging with women as well and trying to educate about childbirth, specifically in the core community. So I've been very grateful that I've given, been given this opportunity today. Fantastic. What I might start by doing is uh, asking a question, and I might ask each of the panelists uh, to respond to this. Uh, 
since we're with you, Aaron, as I might start um, uh, by asking you, can you tell me a bit about what you've been doing during COVID, uh, both from a clinical perspective, but broader as well, um, and how the experience of COVID has been for you? It's uh, just like everyone else in the community, even for healthcare professionals like uh, myself and everyone else, it's been a tough time uh, being, um, I guess, uh, from a clinical point of view, we've had a very different um, perspective from women who are quite anxious right now with the uh, concerns that they have in regards to their childbirth. Of course, obstetrics continues, so women will give birth and that carries on. So I've been looking after women and doing lots of teaching um, where possible for medical students community, uh, in the community and wherever I can get opportunity. Other times I've been painting. <laughs> because we can't really go out much. Fantastic. Landscapes, portraits? Uh, both landscapes. Right now I'm attempting a tribute to Clint Golden Tears. Fantastic. Okay, well, hopefully we can make it the screen background for next time. That's our goal. Uh, Nadia? Um, so I work as a doctor seeing clients in um, a public hospital uh, in Melbourne and at a community health centre. And I feel very lucky to have a job actually during a time when many people have lost their jobs and are unable to work. Um, so I see some people um, in the community health centre. I work in Kensington and Co-Health and we're the local community health centre for the high rise in North Melbourne and Kensington. Um, and we work, I work with a huge team of people to provide low or no cost healthcare and social services to client from, clients from a variety of backgrounds. Um, and when we heard the lockdown happen, we actually contacted a thousand of the, of the 3000 clients in the lockdown and kind of heard about what was going on and tried to provide some support in those settings. Um, and it's been a really challenging time, I think, for a lot of people from migrant refugee backgrounds who are stuck in some circumstances that, um, because of COVID um, have been very distressing. In the hospital setting, I've seen the impact of people who can't speak English feeling further disconnected because interpreters have felt like they're in short supply. You have to talk to everyone behind a mask. It's very, there are fewer visitors. Um, all these things really impact on the care that we're able to provide our clients as health professionals. And it's been quite a challenging time. Yeah, most definitely. We might come back and tease out uh, some of those experiences in a little bit, particularly around um, the impact of clients uh, who are facing multiple stresses, including both employment um, and, and also the sort of stress of lockdown. Uh, could I? Um, yeah, fingers in a lot of pies all at once. Um, so clinically, um, I've been actually doing hospital in the homework, so doing aged care uh, visits to facilities that have outbreaks um, and at some that don't, um, and seeing how that plays out for the families and also for the residents and the workers in those um, facilities. Uh, working on an electronic medical record project in the middle of a pandemic, so we had a big um, <laughs> new medical record go in at um, Royal Melbourne uh, Royal Women's and Peter Mac on the 8th of August in the middle of that and then just trying to keep the wheels turning at home and in life generally so um, and like um, I also work at CoHealth um, and that clinic as well has gone through a, a lot of transitions trying to adjust to um, the demands of sort of virtual care uh, at a time when I felt like a lot of my patients would actually be far better served or my clients would be far better served by actually having face-to-face -face clinics. So I've tried to keep them going as face-to-face -face, um, wherever possible as well. Um, so yeah, lots of things happening all at once. Fantastic. Um, just picking up on that point, um, and I might ask uh, each of the panelists, in, in terms of vulnerabilities for some of the clients that you're seeing, um, uh, you mentioned uh, virtual care can often be quite difficult, uh, particularly, I would imagine, uh, if you're dealing with uh, complexities around culture, language, um, as well as just uh, the general complexities of life. What have been some of the obstacles to switching to sort of um, e-health or telehealth um, uh, during the pandemic? Um, I might, um, sorry, I might start with you, could I? Sure. Um, it, the challenge comes because we were never fantastic at doing care for culturally and linguistically diverse groups to begin with. 
So when you then have to transition that to being virtual and you're sending out SMSs or you're phoning people and trying to get people to know how they're supposed to attend for their appointment, you've already started from a fairly, I think, substandard base and then trying to flip that to a virtual model, which doesn't really serve people particularly well. And I actually started off my first um, two fortnights of clinic. I actually did do uh, via phone and video, and then I just decided it, was, um, it wasn't good enough. So I actually um, converted to doing all of my, offering people the option of coming in or doing video or phone um, so that people could merely make that choice. And, and there are just some things that I, I couldn't do. And this is coming from somebody who's like, a, I, love, I love video conferencing. I'm all for trying to use technology wherever possible. That's kind of been my mantra for the past five years. Um, but also really having to accept yourself that sometimes it's just not going to be good enough and you need to give people that option and keep that door open for people to get the care in the way, um, in the way that they need for, for that for whatever condition um, that, that you're trying to address. Um, and also a really um, unfortunate series of, of so I've had some um, clients who were actually overseas when all of the lockdown and their flights closed down and then that having to try and completely flip their treatment plan. So for HIV care, because they couldn't actually get the medications that they were getting here. Um, so a lot of kind of negotiating the challenges of different health systems, but on an international level, which I found really kind of, yeah, that's been a real <laughs> mind blown trying to understand how to make the most of a very um, unexpected and, and weird situation for, for them as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, in terms of technology, I might just open that up. Um, technology obviously uh, has great advantages, but one of the difficulties is that it's really changed the nature of boundaries between home and work. Um, how um, have uh, you dealt with that um, as a panel? Does anyone have any sort of particular experiences? Otherwise, I'll um, specifically ask. Does anyone want to uh, jump in? I don't know. I'm sure. Oh, go on. I think I think for many working mothers who have their fingers in a huge pies that that balance or blend between home and work is always a bit blurred and um, for me I've been able to work from home for certain things and that's actually helped in some ways I get to have lunch with my kids some days take the dog for a work or do a bit of yoga between zoom conferences um, but clearly the clinical work um, it's not possible but uh, I yeah it's, you know, what you can do. Um, so I think in some ways, some of those working things have been made easier. The, the things that I do from home have been easier than going in and saving on, you know, some of the commuting and things like that. Aranas? I wanted to share something that we've been doing with technology. Now, I agree, we are very restricted with what we can currently do in terms of reaching out. And, uh, but in terms of patient care, of course, we, I mean, personally, I've been doing mostly face-to-face -face and very little telehealth because it's pregnancy and childbirth related. But women right now are so concerned about their childbirth experience and lack of knowledge, their birth classes being compromised. So what we've done is created a lot of simulation videos and used that, you know, into um, to create a bit of a lifelike experience for women to um, engage and we are hoping we are doing going to do this in different languages so that's the next step um, and that would be really good for migrant women to feel connected something we always wanted to do but now is the opportunity so can you tell us a bit more about the nature of those videos uh, right so uh, what really is concerning women most is what happens in hospital when they come in to give yeah. birth right so yeah. that's the main concern that they have of course there are other issues like whether their partners will be present or not. So what we've done is just especially for first time mothers who are new, uh, we are creating a set of videos uh, to give them an, um, a snapshot. As you know, picture speaks a thousand words, give them a bit of a snapshot in how, um, you know, what would happen when they are giving birth. What, uh, so simulate that on models, simulators where you can see the baby come out of the mother's pelvis. A plastic model not a not a real mother and uh, and yeah show all of that uh, how it happens how is the baby doctor present and what do they do to resuscitate the baby and how do we care for the mother as a team 
of midwifery and medical professionals. Mm. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, it's funny, Carla. I should probably add as well. So I've been doing a lot. I was very concerned that certain people were missing out on the messaging about public health and COVID. And I wasn't sure what sort of um, accessible information there was for certain people. There are lots of translated resources, but if you don't read or you don't access the internet or the right website, it's very hard to find out that information. And so I kind of put the word out to our bicultural workers at Cohealth saying, if anyone wants an information session, I'm happy to give one. Mm. Um, and I've done a number of teleconferences um, with a free call number run by the Somali Women's Development Association. Jalene Abshik puts together these conferences anyway and invited me along. And we had just talks over the phone, which worked for some women. Um, um, and then a few women's groups have put together their own Zoom sessions and I've been on them and I've been showing them about wearing masks and what a swab looks like and, um, and how hard it is having kids at home. But they've been really interesting conversations because I've been hearing what their experiences have been like and being able to answer their questions in a very accessible manner um, with interpreters um, or community members as well. So that's been fascinating. On that, what have been some of the themes that have kind of come out from those conversations that have been um, poignant or um, very much indicative of the sort of the, the pathway through COVID for uh, communities? Um, so it's really, and I think it really depends on the different types of communities, but most, most people have family overseas and they're hearing and seeing from their families what's going on. And it's really scary, I think, for certain communities um, to hear what's happening overseas from their loved ones. But here in Australia, the message was very different when COVID first came and it seemed to be people in the um, Stonington areas or Portsea or Sorrento and not really the communities where they're affected in Melbourne at the moment, which is the lowest socioeconomic and most diverse, culturally diverse suburbs in Melbourne. And so those messagings were kind of mixed messages. And um, there were some kind of thoughts that actually there's no COVID in our communities, is there? Because they didn't actually hear any messaging around that. Um, and some really simple questions. So I, I kind of, you know, I said, do you want to go through the symptoms of COVID? Because we'll talk about them. And they said, yes, please. Um, and you, you think, you know, because of all the things that are on the media, things like the symptoms wouldn't be, would be something that people would know, but they wanted to go through them again. And what a test looks like. So I found it really hard to find um, a video of someone from a diverse background getting a swab. And so to actually talk about, well, what does it feel like? How many seconds do they stick it into your nose for? How many... Um, and I actually had to have a swab myself yesterday and I've taken a selfie um, so I can send a, a video that I'm going to send to those women's groups because I've been doing it with a pencil and with a swab, but not really doing it because it's really hard to imagine what it's like. And it's a bit scary if you don't know what it's like and you don't want to expose your children to a test. Um, the other questions I've got are things about vitamin D deficiency. You know, does vitamin D protect us from COVID? Um, and questions about can you get infected? Because there was a lot of thought, well, if you can get infected, and it's not so bad when you're young, what difference does it make? And these are questions that lots of other communities and people from all backgrounds have, and to be able to have a platform where people could answer those questions or mm. ask those questions in a safe space. Um, we talked about the challenges of wearing masks or wearing a, a hijab as a mask. Should you wear a hijab as a mask? Should you wear your scarf? How is, how is a safe way to take it off? How do we wash our hands? How do we get our kids to wash our hands? Lots of conversations. Um, but they're not that dissimilar conversations from conversations that any mums would have really who don't have access to the sorts of information. And I know what it's like having kids at home. It's really hard for me to get online and find out the latest COVID information anyway. And I'm really educated. So I have to take time out to do that. And if you've got five kids at home, if you're living in an overcrowded house, if your husband's or partner's lost your, your job, if you've lost your job, you've got a lot of other stresses going on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, the water. Yeah. Oh, hi. Yes, the water well does has been doing amazing sessions. I should say that. So, fantastic. Um, Nadia, I'll just start stay with you for one second. You mentioned that um, uh, while we're on the same, you mentioned that you had gone into um, the towers um, as part of the work that you were doing and work with patients around um, uh, uh, the lockdown. What were some of the experiences that came uh, out of that and what is, were some of the aspects that you found um, confronting or surprising? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think well before the lockdown in the towers happened, a lot of us at Cohealth were wondering who's 
what messaging is going out there. And it was interesting, you know, when there was that testing blitz in Victoria, there weren't any testing centres near the really high rise, high density areas. Um, you had to be able to drive to a testing centre. And in fact, I had that experience yesterday when I rode my bike to a testing centre and I was sent away because I wasn't in a car. <laughs> so, um, and I think these things are still existing. Um, I went to the high rise, not during the immediate lockdown, but just after as we were setting up. So CoHealth set up a number of primary healthcare services and mental health care services there mm -hmm. um, to make sure that people had the medication that they needed and could see a doctor if they needed to um, and set up a lot of kind of virtual hospitals um, for those things, for, for people in the areas. I had a lot of telephone con um, and still do have a, little t a lot of telephone co um, contact with clients who are in the towers. Um, but at the time of the immediate lockdown, all of us who have our clients on our phones, I sometimes have a few boundaries blurred, SMSing, are you okay? What's happened? Um, and getting videos of police um, out the front of people's doorways, um, getting stories about people who couldn't, didn't have nappies for their children for 24 hours, didn't have food, um, and a real fear. And one woman said to me, you know, when I looked out of that, and I've had permission to tell these stories, I should say, they've given me permission. When I looked out of my flat and saw 600 police, I thought, oh my goodness, this is just like home, but it's not because I can't run away. In home, I could run away. Here I am stuck in a high rise. Mm. Um, there were a lot of worries about women who thought their children would be taken away if they were found to be positive, mm. um, or if the mothers were positive, they'd be taken away from their children. There were some rumors about camps being set up at the showgrounds to house people. But someone called them death camps. What are these camps? Um, a close friend of mine who doesn't live in a high rise but is of um, uh, African heritage had a door knocker at her house. And the description that she had of how she felt during the door knocking process, she ended up finding out she was, pod well, can I, do you have time for me to go through? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really up. interesting. And she's given me permission to tell this story. So she said, when the lockdown happened, um, she doesn't live even in the high rise area, but she said, you know, my husband and I hadn't had any symptoms, but we'd had some very mild symptoms three weeks before. And we hadn't got tested because they went away almost before we got them. Um, three weeks later, we got a knock on the door and they said, get a test. And we're like, well, we don't have any symptoms. And also why should we pay? Why should we get a free test from the government? We work, we can go and get our own test. And so there's that misconception that they think that we need things for free. And then why are you targeting me? Is it because I'm African? Why, I, you know, I don't live, and you want me to walk down the street and get a test done in my street? That's really, you know, there's no privacy there. So they, her and her husband went on their own and got their test from their local doctors and they found out they were positive. And it was three weeks after they had symptoms. And the first thing that happens, they got called up by the Department of Health and she said that the air integer, um, interrogation that she got um, because she was already worried and stressed. She had kids at home running around. It was a 40 minute conversation. She felt completely violated and like she was a criminal. Mm. And I'm sure that was not the objective at all of, pub of contact tracing. We know contact tracing is important and it's important to make sure that we know who contacts are. But it was like, well, why did you go out? And she's like, well, I didn't have any symptoms. Why did you do your shopping? Because my kids needed to eat. Um, but um, my friend has a background of, of a refugee background and felt so traumatized. When we talked, she said, I wanted to leave the country. I don't feel Australian anymore. I want to leave. I, it was the worst possible thing. Um, and so I think part of our job as health professionals, as leaders in this space is actually a healing. Um, and this is what we do anyway, outside of the COVID space, I reckon. I don't know if I'm going to get nods from all of you guys, but it's, it's about making sure that people feel welcome and safe in the space to access healthcare. Yep. Um, and some of the things that happened around that time were very traumatizing. I want to pick up this theme uh, and if possible, um, throw to you, Klipsai. Uh, stigmatization we've heard has been part of some of the issues around the COVID response um, and a feeling within certain communities that there's a stigmatization associated with being positive to COVID. Um, first question, um, is there things that we could have done better in terms of the, the public health response to mitigate that? And how do, we, how do we work with that in terms of communities to reduce that level of stigmatization? And how big an issue do you think it is? Uh, it's, 
It's a huge issue, but it's not one that started with COVID. So I think one of the reports that I'm always sort of keeping an ear out and an eye out for is the um, social commentary and racism report that comes out annually that looks at the ways that people of, um, you know, culturally, um, cu culturally diverse groups are portrayed in the media. I think last year's um, report, they looked at 280 odd media articles and found that sort of 60, 57, 60% of those articles portrayed people that are culturally diverse in a negative light. So that's kind of our context. That's the Australia that a lot of migrant people live in, that when they turn on the news and there's a story about African people, it's African gangs or it's this group. And when you're calling out somebody's ethnicity or their background, it's usually to um, confine them in some, some image that either has media appeal or buzz appeal or whatever it is. And that it's not often that you're turning on the TV and hearing about stories of courage, of growth of people who've come to the country and done extraordinary things, even though that that's really the, the true reality of the migrant journey is that people come to this country and they work and they excel, they flourish because often the circumstances that they've left have not enabled them to do that. So when they get here, it's like, finally, we're free to do what we know we're capable of doing. Um, so in that context, then you lay on top of that COVID and I really, I, I still feel so, um, so much for my friends and colleagues, particularly of Asian background, so Chinese migrants groups who have reported repeatedly from the beginning um, that they have been subject to physical, physical abuse, um, verbal abuse, um, abuses of all kinds, or just the intimation or, you know, not even being able to cough or sniffle in a train because people will look at you askance because, you know, uh, and, you know, we've had world leaders who have also promoted um, that sort of, um, you know, that sort of dog, dog whistle commentary where you're trying to get people um, to, to, to feel an anxiety or antipathy um, towards our cultural groups. So COVID um, really gets exposed a lot of that underlying uh, that undercurrent of p how people perceive people and you know in Melbourne we had um, you know around the time when we had that beginning of that second peak we had um, you know former polit political commentators making the claim that it was Sudanese um, Muslims who had been part of the cause of that initial second wave um, and as it turned out it was completely you know, it was it was not factual at all. Um, firstly, the Sudanese groups were not Muslim at all. Not that that makes any difference, but it was just um, that once that's out there, it's already, you know, it's already flown. That message is already flown. It's been received somewhere and it's resulted in a community group feeling really deeply unsafe. And that the point that you're making, Nadia, around creating spaces where people feel safe, because what that means is that if you then ask somebody from that group, whether you're Chinese, you're Muslim, you're Sudanese or whatever background you are, you then are actually feeling anxious about seeking out medical care because of how you will be perceived. Why are you coming? You know, there's a message of guilt around there, around blame, as opposed to we want you to seek care because we want you to be well. And we know that there'll be circumstances that will be completely out of your control, whether it's the fact that you were not able to stop working because your job doesn't allow you to stop working. And here I'm thinking about abattoir workers, people, you know, large groups of migrant groups who support um, aged care facilities, healthcare, who don't have a choice. When you look out your door, when your Uber meal comes tonight, you know, look at the person who's coming to deliver that and know that they are somebody who probably hasn't had a choice of working in really highly casualized workforce where you're just working day, to, day in, day out. Um, and that's, I think that's what's really kind of pained me through this is that the narrative arc around COVID has been deeply, um, it has been racialized at times. Um, and it has unfortunately been really punitive for some, for, for certain groups and particularly migrant groups and people of refugee background. Um, and, you know, and then there's the, the additional layer of um, the fact that we now acknowledge that across the world, so US, Europe, um, you know, UK, US, that people who are of um, ethnic minorities have also been subject to higher rates of infection and have also died at higher rates. And that's nothing to do with ethnicity. It's got to do with the structural context that they live in that puts them at higher risk and also means that they've traditionally had poorer access to early care and the support that would allow them to have, you know, comparable outcomes and comparable experiences um, throughout COVID. So, I mean, lots of 
layers at, at which this plays out? I might just um, stay with that theme and, and also ask, um, in some senses, what we're talking about is um, there's been also a disproportionate burden within society around who's had to carry a lot of the sort of both the front line in terms of service delivery. Um, so um, Uber workers being uh, one of them, but um, also sort of frontline staff in healthcare, uh, in supermarkets, in, uh, in various kind of service industries that's, that have had to maintain. Um, in terms of the impact both on healthcare, but, but also the psychology around that um, and the sense of um, underlying anxiousness that we've had within society, um, has that been a, um, a burden that's been disproportionate as well, do you think? Absolutely, I think we can all say. Um, I just think it's people, it's the groups of, of, of often people from migrant backgrounds have often other intersections of disadvantage, yeah. especially when you're a new migrant in a new country and, and you don't necessarily know, speak English yet, and you have to get the jobs that you're, you're able to get. And sometimes because of the wage of some of these low paid jobs, you have to work in three different locations. I have clients who travel an hour and a half for a four hour shift in an aged care facility, you know, and that's not going to pay the rent. Um, and I've said, you know, if we could, we could actually predict who's going to have the biggest burden of COVID from those social determinants and the intersections of social determinants, um, the sorts of jobs people have. Um, and ethnicity is a, a surrogate marker actually for those other intersections as well. But when you put racism on top of that, and the fact there's a lot of qualified people who can't get the jobs and the qualifications that they have as well because of some of those uh, intersections. I wanted to add on to what, um, uh, what Nadia said was that um, the impact on migrant communities has been quite significant in terms of healthcare. Like I look after a very broad healthcare uh, population with women coming for, you know, for contraceptive needs to, um, women suffering with their periods, giving them trouble. And, and give, uh, given the uh, impact on minorities, it's, it's been huge that they are not seeking out help for other healthcare issues where they should be coming out. And, and it's more in the, um, in the migrant communities, one, because of financial issues, two, because of uh, hesitation to, in regards to uh, coming out and speaking, which which is even there prior to COVID, but COVID's made it worse. Like they're uh, very reluctant to come out and speak about their concerns. Things like contraception um, has taken a back seat because you know it's no longer important. Their pap smears or whatever don't count anymore because um, many clinicians are not doing face to face, and and even the ones who are, um, the clients themselves aren't reaching out. And, and that's going to have a huge long-term impact post-COVID as well. I want to ask about that, which is what, um, so we've obviously spoken about how COVID affects different communities in different ways, but um, what are going to be some of the long-term impacts of the way in which COVID has disproportionately fallen in terms of the burden? It's the change in behaviour. I think that is going to be a lasting effect because uh, some of the weather that's, that comes uh, from an economic hit that people have taken or um, so they can't afford to pay for their appointments anymore. Public hospitals are already uh, stretched their resources. Operating lists have been canceled and um, you know, waiting lists are going to go along. Uh, really uh, will be hard to catch up. So uh, what's likely to be is that the impact is that people are less and less uh, reaching out for their health care. Um, I see a lot of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and you know, lifestyle measures also make a difference. The fact that their exercise has been limited, the fact they're homeschooling children and um, you know, have to have the extra burden of looking after uh, the family who otherwise would have their routines. It's uh, created a lot of stress and tension. Mental health issues have been uh, quite uh, prevalent and, and the concern is that most of those aren't surfacing yet. Most mm. people are not coming out with that, with those problems and especially in migrant communities that will have a lasting effect. 
Yeah, Carla, I think it's worth mentioning though that the broader Australian community and the, the mainstream, the hegemony that we see um, are also really, really suffering. It's really important to acknowledge that COVID has impacted on everyone, not just migrant communities. I think one of the differences is, and something I think that it's lovely to have this forum to talk about it, is that if you're from a migrant or refugee background community, especially newly arrived um, or fairly new, you don't have the social capital that mainstream communities have. And by social capital, I mean a sense of belong belonging. You don't necessarily have the networks. You don't get that feeling of trust and safety when you open your door or open your newspaper. Um, you don't necessarily have that ability to participate in society as, as other, commun as other um, groups do. Um, and it's that kind of lack of appreciation of your own values and norms um, or appreciation of diversity in the broader Australian society that means that this is why, these are some of the things that make it most impactful, I think. And this is something that I think even post COVID, we need to as a society work on changing to make people more accepted and feel a part of our society. Mm. It's about talking about some of these things a bit more. Um, the, the other side is, is those bare necessities of housing, jobs and, um, mm. and food. But there. Does the process, and this is a question, do, has the processes and the, the, I suppose, the experience of COVID, um, do you think people will come out feeling more or less accepted um, or unchanged? Oh. Such a good question. It's, it's interesting. So I've been in Australia 40 years. I'm a migrant by background. Um, but when I first moved to Australia, I was the only brown person as far as we could see <laughs> our family, you know. Um, but in some ways, I didn't feel unaccepted. And I think one of the interesting things about COVID for me is I've been connected with a lot of people who feel um, who who have been having these dialogues and I feel more connected and more able to speak about these things in a public space. I've got the privilege of having English as a first language. It means it's been much easier for me. Um, I've got a lot of privilege and I'm a doctor. Um, but some of those interactions, I think some of these discussions haven't, they've been had, but not as much. I feel like there's more discussion about these things than there have been, which I think is a good thing. At least I don't feel so alone <laughs> in this space anymore. I wanted to add that lots of, you know, just from what Nadia says, uh, there's lots of, uh, we rely a lot on our social fabric and our family support. And the fact that, uh, and migrant people don't, may not have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of friends or families. One, they're working a long, long hours as well. So they, they may not have that much time to be socializing, but two, because they don't feel part of the community as such. So um, there has been a real concern that um, and, and a lot of learning or like cultural things that we get, for example, looking after a newborn baby, right? You learn from your mother or grandmother or your families, more so in, in lots of communities. And some of those migrant communities are the first question I get asked is, well, I can't get anyone from overseas, my family to come and help. How am I ever going to look after this child? And they have absolutely, um, you know, no confidence in the in how they're going to be able to uh, manage ex those extra stresses that have come through. Um, so I think um, if there, there's lots of work to be done, as Nadia said, in terms of uh, incorporating those societies and making them feel a part of, of the overall Australian community. Yeah, most definitely. No, becoming a parent is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and that was with a lot of support. And even by the third one, it was still terrifying. Um, perhaps more so because I knew what pain was coming. Um, but no, it is. It is. That is absolutely accurate. I, I think from our perspective, one of the things that surprised us in the Migration Council, um, you know, we deal in and think day in, day out that we're an incredibly diverse multicultural community um, uh, as an Australian population. And yet, a lot of the um, government response to COVID really didn't necessarily factor in the level of linguistic diversity. Um, and that was something that I think, you know, 
we assumed, I suppose, took us a little bit by surprise as an organisation um, that, you know, uh, to some extent, a lot of the policy response uh, in terms of the information coming out on COVID and self-care and masks and, um, you know, uh, symptoms and, and, and how, to, um, how to manage the process of, um, uh, you know, social isolation um, uh, um, was really... Uh, was very much language specific in English. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, was that a reflection in terms of on the ground experiences? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah no. And even, even now we're sort of still playing catch ups because it's, um, as a mental exercise, um, I would encourage everybody to try and find a Tourism Australia videos of what we are projecting to the rest of the world around what Australia is and what Australia looks like. It is beaches, animals, and a particular type of person. If you watch that, I think it tells you a lot about what the Australian narrative is around who we are and what we represent and what our values are. And that unfortunately is a thread that winds its way back, you know, through to policy development and what the Australian message is, you know, and that unfortunately feeds through into a lot of the health messaging and how we develop health messaging. And in the digital age as well, we can get messages up really quickly, we can get advertisements out really quickly, but the websites are in English. And then you have to go through the firewall of English, English, English to get to your language specific site <laughs> within that mess. So that's that's what it is you know you wouldn't do it to somebody who is you know either hearing impaired or visually impaired to tell them you have to listen for this then look for that and then you'll find the thing that you're needing to get yourself the health care but yet that is how we currently develop a lot of our health messaging um and we've and i'm sure nadia Aaron, as you've all had the experience of calling up interpreter services and being told there's nobody for that language today or for the next hour, or we can't find somebody. And that's something we live with every day. So this is no, it's, it's, it's not a secret to anybody who works in healthcare that it's still really challenging to get what you need when you need it, even when you're trying, even when you're committed to doing it and you're saying to yourself, I don't want to do this consult without the right language support, you find yourself doing it. Um, and that's still really confronting to me because you feel like you've really let the client down because you haven't been able to, you know, I can only sign language so much <laughs> for some things before you sort of sitting there kind of, oh my goodness, <laughs> this was really not a good experience, but I'm trying my best. Uh, but we've got a, a kind of, we've got a really uh, long, lo long way to go. Um, but steps being made around how we can do this a lot, lot better and be a lot more prepared. And I hope that maybe COVID will show that the importance of being prepared before the crisis, not trying to scramble and get things ready in the middle of a crisis when everybody's stressed now. So when people are stressed, they default to the, to the middle. They default to the easy things to get out. So you can tick a policy box or we made that ad. We've done that pamphlet. Thank goodness. Let's do top 20 community languages. We're done. Not... <laughs> And yeah. then, and then, and then. I can't agree more. It's, I mean, that's why, I mean, I still find it really hard to find a swab off someone's nose and throat in a way that's understandable. You look at those graphics, they're really hard to understand. But even before COVID, if you want to talk to someone about what healthy eating is, um, and they come from anything other than meat and three veg, it's actually really hard to talk about serving size and portion size. If you want to talk to someone about ex exercise, and one of my colleagues, Sabrina Gupta, from Monash has done a lot of research about what perceptions are of, of healthy eating. Um, we don't show what the diversity is in the food that we eat. Even, you know, m most, most people eat a diverse range of sorts of foods these days, and it's not even reflected in our, in our mainstream pamphlets. And in exercise, there's always someone really thin wearing lycra. And thank goodness for Vic Health and This Girl Can and some of the other messaging that's come out in the last few years, but still it's hard. Um, and I don't know about your backgrounds, but I know my background exercise was not on the agenda for any women in my family ever. It was, wasn't a thing that women did. Um, and to try and get that message across about what healthy movement is, that's why I call it movement rather than exercise and how 
It doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym and do this in Lycra, but how can you incorporate movement into your day? Because that's a really important part of your health. And I spend a lot of time talking to my women from different backgrounds about healthy movement and finding um, suitable, thank goodness for Google and YouTube, because I found some really suitable um, exercise videos online. And there's some beautiful people on Instagram and things doing lockdown exercises that are um, appropriate to different cultural backgrounds, but you have to look for them really hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Nadia, that's why you might have also noticed that sometimes, a lot of times with issues like these, you actually have to initiate it. Like, you know, <laughs> people will not come to you asking for that this is, you know, something that I'm interested in. Tell me more about healthy eating or... So somehow you have to bring it in your conversation indirectly or directly related to the clinical condition you are dealing with and, you know, just try to encourage more positive, healthy behavior, which is, uh, which can be difficult, especially if language is an issue. Before we start opening up to questions, um, one of the questions I've got is around um, things like the impact of border closures. Um, so, you know, obviously from a health perspective um, and a public health policy, uh, it's a um, initiative that Australia has taken um, and has, you know, a lot of health evidence um, behind it. But from a psychological perspective and the impact, um, you know, obviously there are people who are trapped who um, are unable to return back from overseas. And some of you have spoken about patients that are in that situation. Uh, but it also means that a lot of people really are looking at a long period where they're not able to see family and those families are often in places um, uh, that are, um, uh, have uh, uh, significantly more higher rates of COVID um, than within an Australian context. So there's an underlying level of anxiety and concern associated with that. And there's also a psychology around sort of the inward looking notion of, um, you know, um, we've kind of gone back to the Australian border context and then the state border context and then sometimes even the suburb border context. Um, the psychology of that and the impact of that in terms of um, patients, uh, how how's that experience unfolded and have you sort of, is that a, an underlying level of anxiety within communities? Um, I think it's one around, you know, loneliness as well. Mm. So often the migrant journey and the refugee journey is one of extended periods of being lonely, whether you're the first person who's arrived for your family or you've arrived with, you know, a distant relative or a friend who's become like family. There's this repeated cycles of loneliness and distance and being away from people that help you meet make you feel safe, who make you feel loved and also know who you are. Because if you've ever, you know, I've had so many conversations with people of migrant and refugee background where they say, Look, people here don't know me. They don't know that I did a degree in, you know, in philosophy in my home country and that I, I was well respected, my family well, well respected. And now I'm here and people look at me as if I'm just, you know, another brown person or another Asian person or another some other thing. Um, so I think that accentuates this because often people have those opportunities of escape or reconnection where you can go, you know, have someone come and visit you from another suburb even. So in Melbourne, yeah, we're down at the sub suburb level of segregation where you can have someone visit you or you can go to a suburb that really reflects you and reflects your culture, your history and, mm. and gives you a sense of place. And to not have that for a prolonged period of time is, is um is really difficult. Um, and I know somebody in the comments there has made a, a comment around the, you know, elderly people, how are they feeling? How are they experiencing this? Um, and the disposability of, of, you know, old age. Um, so that again reinforces that because often at those extremes of age, you might end up living by yourself, um, disconnected or you're living, you know, in a blended household where again, you then have the stresses of lots of people in one location where you don't have a lot of those levers that you would have had otherwise to, you know, go and stay with another family for a time or go visiting. Um, and that re-experiencing of the refugee or the migrant journey um, through COVID and no, no release, like the whole world has become this space um, that people did everything they could do to get away from. Um, so, yeah, it's re-traumatizing, really, um, for want of a better word. Yeah, 
that that's a powerful word yeah and I think very much so I think it's worth noting that I have a lot of clients who are never able to see their family again because they're um, people are seeking asylum on bridging visas and um, you know some of the laws around not having family reunification there's a I've got clients from refugee background who are settled here who still can't get their family and be connected with them um, so I think for them I think COVID is not and I always talk to them because they, they're on WhatsApp and IMO with their family and, and they're saying, you know, we're just as connected. Actually, it's not made much of a difference because I knew I wasn't going to see them anyway. But um, but what was re really interesting and worth saying is for, there's a couple of things that happened in the early part of COVID. So one, um, the money exchange rate for, the only one I know of is the South Sudanese exchange rate in Melbourne went up a huge amount. So people who were sending money to their family in, Sudan, in South Sudan, suddenly were losing like 90% of their fee in their money exchange. Mm. I could not believe this. And young clients that I have who had lost their jobs are sending their Centrelink money to their families because they keep their families alive um, in parts of the world. They're, they're looking after their families financially. And so the impact of losing their job is not just impacting them and their ability to pay rent and find food in Australia. It's actually impacting on lots of other people. I had a, an, another client who, who had recently been reunited with a, um, a brother in a refugee camp and he was sending that money there and the impact of him losing his job was so huge. Um, I think we sometimes, I think a, a lot of migrant cultures, we're collectivists. We look after our own families. We don't just look after ourselves and that's, so COVID has impacted in that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I believe remittance flows are about five times the amount of formal official aid that we sent. Um, I wanted to add on that I look after a lot of economic migrants rather than just the, and these are the, those people who actually don't have, um, you know, they're here on student visas and working all day. Uh, they don't have Medicare benefits and things like that to support them either. Many of them share households and um, you know, to actually be able to pay for their courses that they're studying or um, yeah, pay for their expenses. And, and in that community, in those communities, there's so much anxiety currently because many of their, uh, one, they cannot see their families too, but many of their families are hit badly by the COVID overseas. And for example, I'm talking about the Indian community and I see a lot of those and they are, um, and I relate to them because I've had relation uh, relatives and friends and families who have been affected in India and so I can actually connect with that sentiment and it's so hard the anxiety level is uh, it's uh, so high in, in, in due to those uh, stresses that you know people have lost their parents or their uh, their family relatives overseas and you know that this uh, it's very difficult for them to know about the resources. One, because some of them don't have Medicare, they don't understand how they can reach out and get some access to um, to get some help for their own mental health and things like that. Yeah, um, I should. I just saw one of the questions in the chat said they wish this could be on ABC. I've just completed a three-part session on ABC Melbourne on Facebook. It's called Victorian Voices and with Raf Epstein, and it's on housing, jobs, and well-being. And so there's a lot of links and information for casual workers and um, people who have precarious housing. Um, so please, if I don't know if you can put a link in the chat, please see if you can tap into that. And it's, I, I did it with um, different people each week, including people from refugee backgrounds telling about their stories and, um, and uh, lawyers. So it's worth tapping into if you can. If you could pinpoint one or two things or even three things uh, that would be lessons out of COVID for kind of future ideas of public health and policy making. Um, what would some of those be? Could I, I might start with you. The importance of, I think, preemptive planning and preemptive policy making that supports um, people who are placed at higher risk during you know, unprecedented events like this uh, because you can't do it on the fly. It's really hard to scramble and try and come up with meaningful responses if you don't already have that base. So if nothing else, I would hope that this would be an opportunity for us to look at 
um, what are the resilience factors, what has really helped some communities to be able to respond and how do we reinforce and support them. So for some community groups, so Somali uh, community, you know, they had radio networks. What are some things that we know work and how would we um, find a way to support those resilience factors um, when, you know, for, and it's not just a governmental response either. It's actually tapping into communities and connecting with them and asking, how, how, do, how did you manage? What could have been done to manage? Um, and I know at state government level at the moment, they've got a you know, multicultural task force that's come together. And I really hope, I hope, I, I hope against hope that when they come up with their scope of work or their brief of work that I'll be able to see reflected in that work that they have actually employed people from community and paid them money, actually paying people money as exposed to expecting them to volunteer their time, energy, effort to comment, to give commentary or to do workshops, actually paying people and engaging them in a process that says, we want you to be part of this and we're listening for what would have made a difference to you and that this will be a thread that will continue, not one that ends, you know, 1st of January 2021 or when there's a vaccine, we drop this bundle and we move on, that this becomes something that is embedded in the way that we do things at organisational level, at community level, state, federal level, that we're actually making this part of core business. This is what we do. We are listening, we are responding and we are building on and we're changing changing the system or the frameworks by which we access health in particular to support different groups and to reflect the needs of different groups. Yep, absolutely. Um, and uh, Nadia has posted that. So uh, look at comments if you want to have a look at that. Um, Aranaz, if you could think of one, two or three things that you think would be great to get better next time or um, that should be a real lesson out of this. I think uh, what, I mean, I can't speak about the broader response from governments or institutions, but I think as individuals, we can make a difference. I think each one of those um, of us who are uh, supporting migrant healthcare can uh, can contribute uh, in our own ways to help out our communities and uh, other people around us who, who, who need help. Um, and uh, so one, I think education, I think is a key thing from my perspective. I would uh, think that reaching out to the community and educating them on what are the resources available to them, how, how can we um, uh, provide those uh, options of uh, treatment options or healthcare and just generally even advice about better health and lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, I think is really important. Um, secondly, um, from, uh, we, we need to engage uh, with the, at the community level. And, and uh, so I'm working with the college, for example, Royal College of Australia and New Zealand from uh, in obstetrics and we are creating all these resources for, um, for women and using COVID as an opportunity. Like let's, okay, yes, COVID has hit us in big ways, but yes, it prevents, uh, it does give us an opportunity that are, are we more, um, well, telehealth friendly, can we reach out to the rural communities and um, people who can't get out of their homes and still be able to communicate with them through uh, conversations and, uh, um, or, or health opportunities or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the, these are a few things that I think we can take home um, in regards to be able to communicate better, I think. Fantastic. Thanks. Nadia. Um, is this like the take home? Well, it's funny. I think overall, I still feel, I feel very grateful for our medical health, public health system and the way that we operate in Australia generally. Like compared to the rest of the world, we're doing pretty well. And the way that that curve has come down in Melbourne, I'm incredibly grateful for. I think as um, public health organisations and health professionals, sometimes we expect that people will trust. And I think one thing that we need to do is realise that for, for us as, as health professionals to trust and expect community to trust, our, um, if you expect communities and diverse communities to trust us, we need to actually have trust in the communities. And that needs to, we actually need to change the dialogue around that. 
Mm. And that starts by employing people of, of diverse backgrounds in, in positions where they can influence change. But there's lots, it's not just about education for me, it's about people being, um, and I'm, I'm using a framework that um, Zainab Sheikh, who's the head of the Somali Women's Development Association, who I spoke with on one of the ABC things, the way she puts it, and I'm sure it's from a social background, social work framework, but there's communication trust where it's more about community members being told what they need to know, when they need to know it, but in a way that is understandable. There's caring trust, which is a trust that leads others to believe that no matter what goes wrong, you intend to act in their best interests than rather than from a personal motive. And you can actually strengthen the caring trust with genuine acts and words that express concern. Um, competency trust is built that people are knowledgeable and skilled in what they do, and that's what we'd expect. And contractual trust is that trust that when people follow through on commitments, that they do what they say they're going to do when they're going to do it. So if we're going to build trust in communities, we need to respect and, re and trust the communities that they understand their own health conditions. And we need to kind of cover all those areas of trust. It's not just do this because we say we do, to do it because we're the experts. It's, a, it's much um, different to that. Um, and I think some of the trust that has been broken down over time needs to be rebuilt by looking at the different aspects and really kind of putting, having that message clearer. Fantastic. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please post them. Um, I've had one texted through to me, but if, if people could post during the chat. Um, the question was around boundaries. Um, how have each of you managed boundaries uh, during COVID between patients and home life, between maintaining sanity while looking after, um, you know, uh, patients, communities, uh, extracurricular activities, um, family, extended family, etc. Um, I might start with Kutai. Boundaries, love boundaries. <laughs> um, I I have gotten a lot better at saying no, and I know Nadia, we've had these discussions before about the nice well, nice ways to say no. Um, so I've I've had to get a little bit better at that. And also um, just trying to create some structure around things that are really essential and what is less essential. And I kind of will reflect on Nadia's experience. It's, in some ways, some things have been easier because there's at least there's not the pressure to go out on the weekend or do something. So it has simplified life in some respects, um, which has made, I guess, maintaining boundaries easier because the weekend is the weekend. You're going to the supermarket that is the weekend. There's no, oh, I'm going to a cocktail bar. I'm going to hang out with my friends. There's none of that. It's all gone. Um, so in Melbourne, boundary making has been made easier because of the lockdown that we find ourselves in. But, you know, it's, it's a fluid, it's a fluid process is what I'd say. Nadia, boundaries. Um, so I have had to kind of implement my own self-care plan that I kind of, put up every now and again, and I actually posted it on Twitter today, um, if anyone's interested, because I need to make sure I'm getting enough sleep. I meet, need to make sure I'm exercising, eating properly, um, working out that when my thoughts are sabotaging me to check, check those in and say, okay, um, and, it's, and, and making sure I find some joy and have some connection in my life. And I need to focus on self-compassion because when the self-compassion goes out the window, then I, I blur my boundaries and I feel like I need to do everything for everyone. Um, it's funny and like clearly this, I have a role at the Alfred in wellbeing of junior doctors and I'm trying to teach the junior staff that they need to start with self-compassion and looking after themselves. Because I think sometimes we feel like we're the only ones, not that we're the only ones, but we were so interested in helping other people that sometimes you put your own needs down in order to help others. And that's not very healthy because you have to look after yourselves. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, so my husband, so I'm the primary caregiver because my husband's an intensivist full time. Um, and during COVID has also been very, very busy. I work part time, um, but full time when I'm on ward service at, at the Alfred and pandemic ward service has been easier for me than non pandemic ward service because I have had a full-time childcare babysitter to help me. And I didn't have before and after school activities. I didn't have to make lunch. I didn't have to make breakfast. 
So it's kind of crazy to think that it's less stressful for me to do ward service during a pandemic. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, but that's the reality of, of doing all those things when, when I've got to get the kids to school and do, do all those other things. So, yeah. Um, but I've been, I, I practice mindfulness and meditation as well and yoga and those things. Um, I think everyone needs a time in their day where they don't have to think about all the things that they usually think about. And for me, meditation does that. And it completely keeps me sane. So. Thanks, Nadia. Arunas, boundaries. <laughs> a very difficult question. And I agree with the sentiment across that it's, a, it's been a, look, I've been very fortunate this year that it's um, COVID, if at all, has opened more opportunities. I've been doing heaps of teaching, not just in Australia, through online, but even India, liaising with universities where the, the poor students, medical students can't get to the university or, or to the hospitals. And, and we've been you know, teaching through simulation and all sorts of ways to keep that experience going for them. So that connection with my... Um, country of origin has been um, has always been reestablished, but in a bigger way now. Um, in regards to boundaries, I would say it's very important to be disciplined in terms of your own time. And, and as everyone in the committee uh, in the panel said that we, um, you know, we need to have that me time and have some sort of discipline and time set away. And I do a lot of Zumba. So, which is my time and a lot of painting. And that's, that's really come to my rescue. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to go back to a question that we had earlier, which was really around um, uh, aging migrants and what some of the challenges there have been, particularly around um, a sense of disconnection and loneliness um, and uh, dispossibility. So, um, uh, you know, to some extent, I think um, the future and looking forward um, and how that's been impacted by um, COVID for older migrants. Kudza, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. So I couldn't see that question. Um, is it a question or a comment? If you just kind of read it out for me. Yes. I wonder if the panel can reflect on the experiences of older migrants at this time. There's been a lot of commentary on the dispossibility of older community, uh, older members of our community. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, most of my elderly relatives actually still live overseas. So in Zimbabwe, um, and I have some in the US and Canada. Uh, and I, I think I can reflect on the different experiences of elderly people that I know based on the context that they find themselves in. And I would say in terms of being elderly, you'd be far better off to be in Zimbabwe because the community really respects age in a way that I've never seen, I guess, traditional Anglo Celt Australian culture respect age. So there you will find that if you're an elder, you're deeply respected and people will find ways to look after you and make sure that you're not alone, that there is somebody there looking after you and making sure that you are respected in your older age. But with COVID laid on top of that, um, I've certainly, and I'm sure we've all been witness to the, you know, people or pundits who would suggest, well, if it only kills old people, then why don't we just let it take its course? We'll be done in six months or so, and then it will be over. And that sort of discourse can only occur in a society where age is not respected and one that is either really deeply infatuated with youth. And I think that's kind of where we find ourselves is the global sort of pulp culture is deeply infatuated with ideas of youth and beauty. And that once you're beyond a certain age, what else do you have to give? What more do you have to give? And um, I think it's just sad that COVID has unearthed some of that um, that sort of latent thinking around age and the disposability of older members. But if there's one thing that is certain, one day we'll all be old. And I would hope 
that when I'm old, people will not think of me in that way and that people can actually connect with um, the, the gift of age, the gift of being able to see back a thread in time and to be able to remind us of things that went horribly wrong in the past or things that went really well and what we can learn from the past. Um, because, you know, as it's always said, if you can't learn from the mistakes of your past, you're bound to repeat them in the future. Um, and that's a discussion that you can only have when you're including elders and older people into the discussion around how we respond. And I'm actually really surprised to say I've very rarely seen an older person on TV or in news or in print actually talking about you know, COVID. We're seeing a lot of people, you know, middle-aged people like myself talking about COVID and what it's meant for them. But very rarely are you actually seeing people who are at the, you know, extremes of age coming out and talking about, you know, well, you know, how dare people say that about me that I should just die because it would be easier for the economy. Um, so it's a very real thing. Um, and that's something, as Aaron, I said, that's something that each individual person can do is to check themselves. If you're ever thinking that or feeling that, that's something that you can do something about. And if you're older, um, I hope you know that there are many more people who would not want to see you know, older people die for the sake of resuscitating the economy faster. Aaron I was going to say we need to acknowledge that we are in a very fortunate country and here the response has been, you know, like we respect life and we do want each and every uh, individual of our community is important regardless of their age and ethnicity or background. So I think that uh, that sentiment is something that we want to encourage in, in our younger community as well. These are ideals that you want to pass on uh, to the next generation to respect that. Uh, and, and I think uh, it's, it's a very valid question. Yes, uh, just what Kudzai said, most of it, of course, that um, you know, our response should be that we, we need to care for each other and look out for each other. And that includes all the members of our society. Yeah. Nadia. Yeah, and I think this also plays to um, Chris Lamoe's also written a question in a similar mm. kind of light. Um, it's funny. So I work as a general physician at the Alfred Hospital, and I think 70% of my patients are over 70. And um, I, I take heart in the way that I see people looked after in the hospital setting. Um, but I do reflect that I think the older people are the wisdom of the community and we don't actually touch base with their um, feelings, uh, with their experiences enough. Uh, I think there's a role for us all to role model our care for the older people in society. And I think when I'm on a ward round with my team, I often always ask the stories of my clients, my patients. I say, so what did you do before you retire, even if they're 99? And I still remember a beautiful story. I saw a man um, who ha was a Holocaust survivor. And he said to me, he came and I looked, I didn't know he was, I just saw his surname. And I said, where, you know, what's your story? And he, he had dementia and he's from a nursing home and he was bed bound. And he said, I said, what did you do before you retired? He said, I used to spread the message that the world was a good place. And he said, I came here with nothing at the age of 11 and I didn't, I'd lost all my family and all my friends and Australia made me home and looked after me and cared for me. And when I got a job, my job was to tell people that the world was a beautiful place. And he didn't need to have an able body or a sound mind to be able to spread that message. And he enriched all our lives on that ward round because of that message. And I get these sort of beautiful stories in my work um, from older people. So I think, you know, I don't think, even though the broader society, sometimes we get those wrong messages, there are these pearls that we can spread um, by the work we do. I'm gonna pick up on Chris's question um, and ask it in a slightly different way as well, which is that temporary visa holders have been an area where we've been very reluctant um, as a society to be able to offer support, um, uh, either financially, but, but also many of them um, in terms of their day-to-day -day healthcare needs and their other needs have um, uh, certainly been impacted through COVID. Um, and we, 
In terms of the health response, what are some of the reflections on um, uh, temporary visa holders uh, and what some of the long-term outcomes of that might be, uh, both in terms of perceptions of Australia, um, but also in terms of a, a principle of fairness within our communities? Arunans, can I start with you? Yeah, I think um, this is a, I, I respect the question. I think it's a very valid point to bring to the table because whilst the ones who are, you know, who are fortunate enough to have Medicare and all the facilities available to them, we unfortunately do have a significant amount of temp number of temporary migrants. Many of them are on student visas or temporary work visas, don't know if they will have a job tomorrow or not, or if they'll ever be accepted in the Australian community as, and be able to com call Australia home. Um, they um, currently with the situations, uh, um, I've been told by my patients that the visa queues are becoming longer um, and sometimes, you know, renewal of visas is becoming an issue and many of them are not seeking out health care um, as, as they should because just because they can't financially afford it. So that's, that's a, I, I'm, I'm, I'll relate to one of the women that I saw today and um, she, her, her husband's here on a student visa and she saw me maybe in early pregnancy and then just disappeared. And today I saw, her, I got my uh, secretary to call her. I said, hopefully she's seeing someone else or at least she's being seen um, through her pregnancy. And the answer was no, she's supposed to be seeing me. And now she's 37 weeks about to give birth in one or two weeks. And uh, I haven't, you know, had, uh, she hasn't had any antenatal care. I asked her, she said, nobody guided me. I said, you were supposed to see me in two weeks time after our first visit. What happened after that? And she said, well, there's no one to tell me what to do next. And I have no idea. So they don't have those opportunities uh, to look out, be, be looked after in their healthcare, the, the, like the rest of us do, who fortunately have the um, Medicare and other options available to us. They have to pay for their own private insurance. And, and that is, and they're not the ones who will be getting job seekers or job keepers and all those government benefits. So they're really economically badly hit. And I think um, as, I mean, in my own clinical practice, I go a little extra step to try and support them. Um, in terms of community, I think we, we need to try and um, whatever we can do to reach out to them and see uh, if we can help them in, in their health care, of course, as clinicians, we can. Uh, but as community, we need to believe that these are still, they're still Australian because they're here. And just because they don't have that guarantee that they will be accepted as a permanent immigrant or a citizen in the near future, they, are st they still belong to our community and, and be able to look after them. We've certainly had a lot of reports as well of um, people on student visas or temporary visas who are still here, but whose health insurance is now well and truly lapsed, and they're not uh, lapsed, and they're not able to afford health insurance going forward. Um, uh, but are also in really dire situations, both in terms of just cost of maintaining life in Australia. Um, could I, from a health perspective, uh, temporary? visa holders, um, how have you found the experience of engaging and uh, some of the stories um, that you've encountered? Well, look, I think I'm yes, lucky in that working in the public health services that I work in, it's not actually that challenging to provide care or to connect people with what is needed. Um, where I see there being, uh, I guess, future challenges is that at the moment within the sort of prism of COVID, um, since everybody's, I guess, landlocked, um, there have been opportunities to do a little bit more um, within the constraints of having to do things virtually. Um, but I worry about at the other end when you start to see, you know, even the resilience factors that have been built in for locals start to drop off, how that then plays out to people who are on temporary protection visas and when the sort of this veil of compassion, for want of a better word, that has been put 
out there for this moment in time, whether or not that will just unravel and whether or not things will become even more punitive as the country tries to reform itself and as health services have to try and make difficult decisions around, you know, how they fund um, particular programs, how they catch up on elective theatre lists and particularly um, pressing concern for those areas of health um, that have already, already been challenging to provide even for people with Medicare. So I'm thinking about allied health, mental health, um, dental, um, some of those things that I often struggle to support people with Medicare support to access. What happens then when we're really dealing with people who are trapped here, can't really go home, can't go anywhere, but are forgotten, which is where I think, you know, Chris's question really goes to is that that's a discussion around power, um, privilege, social capital and visibility. These are people who will never be given a platform to say, how are you thinking? How are you going? How has this affected you? Uh, and that's where it gets really hard. And I think it, it puts increased, um, I guess, impetus and focus for us as people in healthcare professions to then find a way to be that voice, to be the one who either raises it in a board discussion or a meeting with your CEO or your senior executive leadership team to say, hey, did you know that there is a group of people in our community who are really struggling at the moment um, to connect with healthcare uh, and have very limited options? Is there anything that we can do? Um, so it's using your own social capital to try and elevate um, those people from that sort of layer of just being completely invisible and certainly not a threat from a political perspective in the sense that they're unlikely to be the people that result in the next government being elected or re-elected or not. Um, but we are in a position to, um, I guess, elevate or surface um, the needs of, of those community members. Yeah. Nadia. I think I, I agree with what Arnaz and, and Kudzai said. I, I think, and something we neglect to really talk about much in Australian society is how dependent we are on the temporary um, the temporary visa holders. Um, they staff all, all the low paid jobs are often temporary visa holders, the things that, that our industries are dependent on. The universities are reliant on the overseas um, student fees. You know, it's, it, it's so, um, it needs to be acknowledged that as a society in Australia, our economy has dependent on, depended on temporary protection, oh, sorry, temporary visa holders. Um, and for many, many reasons, we need to work out how to support them better. Turning it back to a slightly different question, um, what I wanted to ask each of the panellists to reflect on is, um, what advice would you give to migrant women who were looking at a career in medicine or in STEM-related um, fields? Um, uh, what are some of the words of encouragement or, or even discouragement if it's been, a, um, but what, what would you say? Aranaz, can I start with you? Yeah, I'll answer that first because uh, I'm a new, I'm a migrant, can't call a new migrant, but I'm a migrant and been here 15 years and not longer than that. So um, the one advice that I would want to share with uh, everyone is that um, look for your support systems. You'll, you'll find someone who is going to help you. So it's really important to look around and, and it, you may, it may not be the first person who you approach, who, um, but there will be someone who will uh, be able to assist you in your, so just broaden your horizon a little bit and reach out for those um, sources of support. Um, of course, uh, you, you know, they, it, there is, it's, it's not easy because uh, Sometimes, you know, your qualifications might be not accepted as such, or you, you may need an extra upskilling. Uh, there's obviously financial uh, pressures and everything to else as well when you move in. But, if, um, you know, if you are really motivated, um, you can excel and, and do whatever you want to. And, you know, it won't be long before you feel you're more Australian than anywhere else. Uh, I've gone through that same journey myself. So I know that that change does happen when you're able to make a mental shift that you have moved um, to Australia and you, know, you are a part of the community here. So it's, um, 
it it is uh, challenging as a start but you know uh, seek out for help i would say and and don't hesitate because sometimes when you're new you don't reach out to people you're a bit shy unsure about how others around will react i remember being um, a new registrar in the hospital and not asking um, you know questions and things from my seniors as i should have or or not feeling the confidence um, so i can relate to it, um you know, to a new migrant from that perspective but um yeah just hang in there and uh, you will get there good try um i i find like a, a lot of strength inspiration and power in my chosen profession so i would always recommend it um but i think in everything that you do um it's the message around compassion that Nadia had there is to to remember to be compassionate with yourself particularly for people who will have come with degrees who then have to rebuild themselves from the ground up um is to just um in a way accept that that that, that is a process and that road towards i guess reconstituting yourself um it may take time um and time is okay <laughs> um and to to be prepared to commit yourself to that journey of rebuilding um and reclaiming you know what is yours really you know you deserve to have those opportunities those moments of power and that opportunity to sort of express um express your talents in whatever profession it is that you've chosen um and then stem fields are really great because i i found that stem really allows me to also think about the transferability of the skills and my learning um to other contexts so to my home country um to other people in the diaspora who are living overseas whether it's the ability to know use technology or an app to transfer money to support the remittance you know the remittance economy uh there are so many ways in which um the yeah, stem is is able to support um communities particularly migrant and refugee communities um so i'm i'm very positive about um this particular space as a chosen career pathway fantastic nadia advice to young migrant women looking at a stem career um i'd start off by saying don't let your background hold you back whether it does or it doesn't i don't think personally there's ever any need to wonder as you step into your job interview as whether they want to have you as a brown woman i think it's really important to say that because i think every job i've ever wanted and even some i didn't want i kind of walked in there thinking i'm the best person for this job and you're lucky to have me it might sound a bit arrogant but it was kind of the way i was brought up um when i when we came to australia i said you know we're the only brown people in our whole area and I was brought up to think well if you heard things that weren't appropriate or people said things or did things that's their deficiency not yours uh, and it's a really strong belief that you actually need to have inside and actually before I go into any job interview I'm a bit of a sound of music nut but I sing I have confidence from <laughs> the sound of music but it's really important um I've got another four points because I've got five things that keep it the second one is stick to your values so don't do research or something to make others look good or act in a way that's against what you believe in because sometimes to get a particular position people say do this or do that um i remember and as an example i remember once wanting to look at how to improve the way asylum seekers were treated in an emergency department and i was told well that might improve patient care but will it get a big name publication and you'll hear those sorts of things through our careers and if you stick to what your values are i think it keeps you more grounded um don't let people get you down when they do use words to belittle you and realize it's not you it's they probably have a deep seated insecurity um the fourth thing is find mentors i've had a few people who i connect with and not often enough but they've given me real strength in being able to stick to my values and they've been instrumental in helping me make, make decisions whether they know it or not I remember one of my mentors said to me once when I said to him I actually don't feel like I'm enough he said I think you need to get help for that and he was right I think my inner critic was talking and not my inner coach and my kids learn about this in primary school I don't know if your kids are learning about this but I don't think I ever learned about that whole growth mindset um and the mentors can help with those things um the fifth thing is to talk about realizing that you can only do what you can do in your sphere of influence and you can only do what's your best and that best is enough you are enough um when we're working in an area especially in some of these challenging things we've been talking about you cannot change the whole world um mm. but the little bits that you can do are really really important um 
and recognizing that if you have perfectionistic tendencies like I do, work out that maladaptive perfectionism is not good for your soul. Okay, a little bit can help you to achieve goals, but if, you, if you're always trying to do perfectly, you can't because no one can be perfect. So you're enough, I think. <laughs> They're my five things. And you're enough, I think, is a perfect um, uh, point to end on and probably a mantra that we should all tell ourselves um, constantly because I, I think that, that inner narrative that you speak about, Nadia, is so important. Um, uh, I think it's something that certainly wasn't around when I was going through school um, and it's something which through a process of self-discovery uh, has become really important. Um, we speak, I don't know how many words, but I, uh, thousands upon thousands of words to ourselves every day. So speaking some of the positive ones is so important as well. Um, I really want to, we're at time right now, so I really want to thank the panel uh, and um, your insights have been amazing, um, ranging from self-care through to um, uh, uh, global um, forces, um, economy, uh, health. It's been a really fantastic conversation, one that I've really enjoyed and one that I know from the, the comments that the participants have really enjoyed as well. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your very busy day and for ignoring the inner uh, point around boundaries and just saying yes that was great <laughs> to, to participating um, and um, uh, and I also just want to thank Sana uh, for organizing this who uh, is uh, a fantastic driving force between uh, behind Harmony Alliance thanks all thanks Carla thank you community as well and thank you for your organization um, and Harmony Alliance it's wonderful appreciate it Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe and look after yourself. <laughs>